to talk. Mm. So now you just press the continue button if you're happy for that. And um, if you have a question, write it in the chat box. You may find that David answers your questions as he goes along. So, um, you know, bear that in mind. But I know that David's very willing to take questions uh, when he's finished talking. So, you know, if you've got things that you want to ask him, please do put them in. We've got 20 people here now. Gosh, that's a lot. Fantastic. Um, okay. But there may be more coming. So, um, David, I'm going to just invite you to, to start talking. Can I introduce David Rogers then? Professor. David Rogers. Um, he's the retired professor of ecology in the zoology department at Oxford University. And um, David was um, officially the secretary of the No Expressway group, which campaigned against the road that was um, proposed to be built between Oxford and Cambridge. And uh, that group had a significant success in March when the project was officially cancelled. Um, David has now um, taken up the torch uh, to tell people about the government's plans for the Oxford Cambridge Arc, which is something I'll let different. and I'll let David talk to you about that now. Thank you very much, David. Thank you, Caroline. Look, thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, the Oxford Arc plans, they cover five counties. They involve houses, roads, jobs, the environment, and local democracy. And I'd like to cover each of those in the talk. There is still the ambition across the art to build a million houses. Whatever your local councillors say about being able to control that number, it is still the government's ambition, and certainly the property developer's ambition, to build a million houses across the five counties. Although the expressway, the Oxcom Expressway, has been officially cancelled, alternatives are already being looked at in precisely the area where the expressway would have gone. So, Simon, you might be pleased to hear that. All proposed development, everything I'm going to talk about, has the one aim, really. It's to increase the arc's economy by a total of 163 billion a year. And I think we have to ask ourselves, is all the fuss, all the bother, all the confusion, all the destruction worth that sum? And I want to show that that sum is, in fact, um, based on some rather dubious workings from Cambridge Econometrics. The ARC plans also, to keep us all happy, involve the promised double nature across the ARC, and the Wildlife Trust are getting very involved in doubling nature. But this comes at the cost of development. It's uncertain of success, and in fact, the plans as they are at the moment, the suggestions at the moment, doubling nature or attempts to double nature, they fail in two thirds of the attempts where they've been tried elsewhere globally. There's of course much talk about involving the communities uh, to develop the new communities across the arc to give them a sense of place. But to date, there's not been a single public meeting, a single public meeting anywhere across the arc from any arm of government with any of the communities of the 3.7 million people who live in the arc at the moment. This is the plan moving at great speed in a total democratic vacuum. So I'll conclude the talk by saying the Oxcom art plans should be scrapped in their present form because it's a level of overdevelopment. It's based on various dubious grounds and it will spoil the green places and the green spaces in which we currently enjoy living. So I want to start with um, The slides, there we go. This is a picture of uh, somewhere locally and what happens very often is roads get built and roads are in fact built for two reasons in the UK. First of all, obviously to decrease journey times between A and B, but equally importantly from the developer's point of view, it's to open up greenfield land for more development. They are effectively routes along which planners expect houses and housing developments to be built. These are the five counties that currently define the Ox Camark. You can see them on the screen there. And I want to emphasize that every part of every one of these counties will be affected by these plans. Uh, with the abandonment of the expressway, 
people thought the expressway would just affect certain people between Oxford and Cambridge in a rather narrow corridor. Uh, they never would, but certainly with the abandonment of the expressway, it's very clear that these plans affect all the five counties shown on the map. And at the bottom of the screen, you've got the total number of houses, the total population and the total area of those five counties at present. The scheme will add a million houses and nearer two million people. Those are increases of 66% and 50% respectively across the entire area. So what are the art plans in a nutshell? Well, they're more houses and it almost looks as if they're houses without limits. Uh, there is no expressway, but there will certainly be more traffic and they're looking to improve the existing road system to encourage more use of cars. In terms of the economic benefits, they're claiming that they want to create a Silicon Valley effect, which we'll look at a bit later on. In terms of the environment, they want a green art for nature. And this particular part of the plan is being pushed by the Art Universities Group, which has an environmental working group within it. And then finally, as I said before, it's claiming that the uh, communities will be consulted, that decisions will be democratic. Well, so far, none of this has happened. And these plans are being advanced behind closed doors in Whitehall. So many of the promises of the Oxcam art plans cannot be realized in their present form, and many are based on dubious assumptions. Now we can start off with this key document. It's called Partnering for Prosperity. It was produced in this form in 2018 by the National Infrastructure Commission, which is a sort of blue skies looking commission, looking at the future of the UK and what should be developed. And the key headlines in this report, which were pushing for Oxcam art development, are shown here. They wanted East West Railway, which is going ahead. They wanted an Oxcam expressway, which has been canceled, a million houses, 1.1 million new jobs, and all of the above were to achieve this very important sum of 163 billion pounds increase in the economic output of the five ARC counties. Now, when you look at the uh, NIC report, this report, it says that careful research has shown that in order to achieve this 163 billion increase, we need the million houses and the 1.1 million workers in those houses. There's a very tight relationship between the prize, the economic prize, and the number of houses required to achieve that prize, at least according to the NIC document. I'll show you in a minute, this is totally false. Now there are two key documents which in fact contributed to the Partnering for Prosperity document. One was from Savills, obviously the estate agents, and one was from Cambridge Econometrics. Savills were asked to look at three different growth scenarios for the art region. Baseline, sort of business as usual, incremental, meeting some local needs, and then finally transformational, which was maximizing the growth across the five art counties. And in terms of baseline, at the bottom here, we've got the numbers of houses that needed to be delivered per year under each scenario. This is the annual housing delivery figure and the different colours refer to the different counties of the Oxcom Art region. Under baseline, we're building slightly more houses than we built historically. These are the figures for the, I think the 2017, the realised figures by the five counties. Under the incremental scenario, that figure was increased to 20,000 new houses per year. And under the transformational scenario, the figure was increased to 30,000 houses per year. And uniquely, the transformation scenario included this cross-hatched area here, which were 7,000 houses a year for London commuters. They were already planning that the arc should become a dormitory for London commuters, or at least for some London commuters. Now, when you go to this earlier report from Savills on how they justified 30,000 houses a year, for more than 30 years, which gives us the million total. They didn't justify it in terms of jobs or, or, or the what business of the art. Oh. They justified it in terms of these two factors here. First of all, they said the corridor must take a chair of the national uh, ambition to build 300,000 houses a year. I, I, was, I was iPadding actually. 
which could yeah. somebody mute please because Yes, I'm, I'm actually in a um, Zoom meeting, you know, one of these environmental things. So I've, I've had to sort of come out of it, but anyway, never mind. Uh, bye for now. <laughs> the 300,000 years... Well, because yes. the phone kept ringing, I thought it was you, you see. Um, um, whoever's yeah. talking on the phone... Talking oh, to stop it. Yeah. Anyway, I'll, I, it doesn't matter. I can whoever get, is talking on the phone, okay. can you please mute? Uh, Uh, the government target in 2016, as it is now, of course, was 300,000 new houses per year. And what Savile said is, well, look, if none of the local authorities across the country can collectively produce 300,000 houses a year, then the balance can simply be dumped in the Oxcam corridor. There's lots of space there. The counties can take it. The second reason was that the corridor must also meet the housing needs of economically connected areas, which, of course, means London, where we're not building anything like the number of houses required for the increase in population of the capital. So if you read Savile's report, it's pretty clear that those million houses for the Oxcam Arc have nothing to do with care for research, nothing to do with the needs of the Arc communities, nor even of the businesses across the Arc. It's simply going to be a dumping crown for a very large number of houses. Where might those houses be built? Now, this is a map from that NIC report, Partnering for Prosperity, and it shows the county boundaries. This is, of course, Oxfordshire. It shows boundaries of other areas which aren't quite the counties given the names here, Bucks and Beds, for example. But this was the area originally defined as the Oxcom Arc. And Savills distributed the million houses across this area. And you can see each area has a pie chart with three different colours. And those three different colours in pink refer to currently planned homes. These are homes in the already approved local plans. Now you'll see, you might just be able to see here that in Oxfordshire, they reckon that there were 60,000 homes in currently approved local plans. Well, the Oxfordshire growth deal has bumped that up to 100,000. So it's already greater than uh, Savills was assuming. The second part of the pie chart in blue are for London commuter homes. And the final part in brick red, by far away the largest chunk of the pie charts all the way across the arc, with the additional Oxcam Arc homes that would be unlocked by all of Oxcam Arc development. In total, just for Oxfordshire, that was 300,000 houses of the million in total, and the rest were distributed across the other areas there. Now, when we compare these additional houses to the existing housing stock, we can see there's been an enormous increase. So for example, the additional 300,000 is more than we've got at the moment. There are at the present only about 280,000 houses across the entire county. Adding 300,000 increases them by 105%, the figure in yellow here. And the same is true across all of the ARC areas. Now we need to compare these figures, these percentage increase in current housing stock with this figure down here, which is the figure of the Office of National Statistics, which is the predicted increase in household numbers by 2050, which is the same period of time during which these additional houses will be inflicted across the arc. So that you can see in Oxfordshire's case, we are being inflicted with a growth rate, which is six times that predicted by the Office of National Statistics for the country as a whole. Four times here, five times here, five times here. This is an enormous level of development being squeezed into a relatively small part of the country. Why? When we look at Oxfordshire's growth in the past and present and proposed in the future, we have total population on this axis and time, in fact, since the Doomsday Book here. And from the Doomsday Book, from the many centuries afterwards, this is the increase in Oxford's population to the 2011 census. What happens after that? Well, this is what will happen under the Oxfordshire growth deal and under the Oxcam Arc plans. This is clearly an exponential rise in population across the county. And for each of the counties in the Arc, we could produce exactly the same shaped curve, a curve which is simply upswinging. And it raises the question, do the planners believe there really are no limits to grow across the Arc? And Kenneth Boulding, who himself was a planner, said anyone who believes in exponential growth 
can go on forever in a finite world is either a madman or an economist. Mm. Do you remember I said that the ONS Office of National Statistics predicted a 16% increase by 2050? That 16% equates to about 3 million homes across the length and breadth of the country, which is everything in white in this map, including, of course, Northern Ireland. And here in pale blue is the Oxcam Arc. The Oxcam Arc is supposed to receive one million of the three million total, one third of the total, in a land area which is less than one twentieth of the land area of the entire country. Why should this area receive such a high level of overdevelopment? Because, of course, if we receive a million houses and all the workers that go with them, we will have to suck the workers from other areas of the country where otherwise they might live and work. Those are the houses. The roads, well, there is no expressway, that was cancelled in March of this year, but there will be more traffic. And when Highways England gave up planning the expressway, a regional transport body called England's Economic Heartland uh, was already working on a regional transport strategy and came to the fore with these proposals to increase connectivity across the ARG area. Now on this map, this is obviously Oxfordshire, so Oxford is here, and this is Cambridgeshire here, there's Cambridge City. And the oblongs here are transport corridors, mostly roads, that the EEH is looking to improve, to improve the connectivity along these corridors. And there was a meeting following the release of this document in about February of this year, when we were told by EH that the road improvements are only to meet existing needs. That means the houses we already have, houses in local plans, but no more. Now, under the EH's own predictions for the future, it doesn't imagine the million houses of the NIC, but it's done its own modelling. It says there should be 860,000 more. So it's looking to develop the existing road system only to meet existing needs, but it's also planning to add 860,000 more houses across the ARC area. How will meeting existing needs also meet the needs of the 860,000 plus cars that will come from all those extra houses? The EH is rather silent on that. It also has a plan to decarbonize the entire vehicle fleet by 2050, including the extra cars from all those extra houses. But that seems to be entirely wishful thinking. They draw a line from the carbon output of all the traffic across the area now in 2021. They draw a line from that level down to zero by 2040 or 2050. And they say, this is our path to decarbonizing the entire vehicle fleet. But so far, it's just wishful thinking. There aren't any detailed plans to make it come about. At the moment, EH has two open consultations. It's asking for our thoughts on two corridors here. One is corridor A, outlined in brown here, which is the Oxford Milton Keynes corridor, the corridor that the expressway was targeted at. And the one in purple is the Oxford Northampton Peterborough cor corridor, um, which also carries, of course, a lot of traffic. So if you'd like to respond to that consultation, there's an open consultation on its website. They're fairly vague questions, I must say. It's, it's the sort of questions like, what do you want a transport system for? How do you think we can improve transport across this region? There are no detail, there are in fact only four questions. So no expressway, but certainly an increase in the number of cars expecting to use the transport network across the region. The economy, this is what it's all about. This is what all these plans are for. And they want to create a Silicon Valley effect. Now let's have a look at the real Silicon Valley because it's quite interesting. This is the Silicon Valley, of course, in Western uh, USA. And it's mostly here, it's actually also sometimes uh, San Francisco is included. But the real valley is here. It's centered around the Santa Clara Valley here. It's got about the same number of people as the Ark. It's about a third of the arc area in total, or a third of the length of the arc. And if we look at the development of Silicon Valley, this is the Santa Clara Valley in the 1950s and 60s. 
Now, Silicon Valley really began to develop with the invention of the transistor in about the 1980s. So everything that you're about to see has really happened in the last 40 years. That's the Santa Clara Valley now. And what's been happening in Silicon Valley? Well, you can see the statistics there. In recent years, Silicon Valley has vastly increased the number of jobs, but hasn't kept up by building new houses for all those workers. The result is that house prices have increased by a million in seven towns in the 10 years to 2017. And the result of that is that many of the major high-tech industries that settled in the valley are now leaving, Tesla, Oracle, and HP. HP is particularly ironic because there's a garage in Silicon Valley with a memorial plaque on it, like our blue plaque saying, this is where Silicon Valley started, where Mr. Hewlett and Mr. Packard produced their first oscilloscope, which was the foundation of the Silicon Valley experiment. In 2016, almost half the residents of Silicon Valley said they wanted to leave. It was just getting too impossible, too expensive to live there. Is this really what we want for the ox come up? Because this is what our leaders are saying they want to develop in the UK. Now, there's a second document that contributed to Partnering for Prosperity, and it's a document that dealt with the economy. It produced that figure of 163 billion. And it's almost as if this second document was produced as a response to Savile's first document, which simply said, well, let's dump a million houses there because the government realized that nobody wants a million houses dumped on their doorstep. And one suspects that Cambridge Econometrics was simply asked to put lipstick on the pig. The Savile's pig of a million houses was very unpleasant. They had to make it look attractive by saying, well, there's a huge economic benefit of all those million houses. Now, I don't want to give you too many figures, but you remember that Savile's had the baseline incremental and transformational surrounds of growth. This is the highest, this is the lowest. And these are the number of people across the arc in 2014. Of course, the same in all scenarios. And then according to the different scenarios, there will be different numbers of people, jobs uh, by 2050. And the result is the increase in the GVA, which is very like GDP, across the arc by 2050. So the transformational scenario would increase the GVA from that figure to that figure, which is an increase of 163 billion that magic figure we saw on one of the first slides, this is the prize that the transformational growth will give, according to Cambridge Econometrics. These are the three scenarios, and the key figures here are, this is the GVA output in 2014 for all three scenarios, because this is before the growth starts, and this is the GVA by 2050, giving us, as I say, these increases on the right, this one being the one that the partly for a prosperity document wanted to aim for. Now, the thing is that the modeling that produced that figure actually mixes three rather different things. One is an increase in population. One is an increase in productivity per worker. And then the final thing is the Silicon Valley effect. Now, the Silicon Valley effect is called by economists the agglomeration effect. It simply means that if you have businesses developing in very close proximity to each other, they could share ideas, they can share personnel, and there's a lot of exchange of information between them. So that their economy gets, uh, 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 goes at a rather rapid pace and develops very quickly. London effectively is our real example of the Silicon Valley within the UK. Now the enthusiasts for the arc reckon that, well, we can't change the geography of the arc. Oxford is about hundred kilometers away from Cambridge as the crow flies. But they argue that if we increase the transport systems across the arc, we effectively decrease the geographic distance because people can travel more freely and they can exchange ideas as they would do in the Silicon Valley itself. The sort of water cooler moments. Now, let's have a look at those three different ingredients according to Cambridge Econometrics modeling. The increase in population. These are the workers in 2014. These are the workers that uh, Cambridge Econometrics imagined by, uh, according to the three growth scenarios. There's an increase in the worker population. The second thing they imagined is that the output per worker would increase. Now, it would, it would increase in the same way across all three scenarios. They simply said, look, the workers become more productive. Wherever they are, they will become more productive. They couldn't, and they didn't justify this claim. They just made the assumption. 
this is what's going to happen. And you can see there's an almost doubling of output per worker across this period of time. It's quite a, a, a fantastic increase. And then finally, there's the Silicon Valley effect, the effect of the agglomeration. Uh, and, and you can attribute these numbers to the agglomeration effect. So if we go back to that original table I showed you before, and remembering now that the increase in GVA was due to three different causes, increasing number of workers, increasing output per worker, and then the agglomeration effect. We can assign values to each of these, and we can add them up to get the increase we see in this column here under the three scenarios. And here's the output of the transformational scenario, the increase in GVA under the transformational scenario. We can assign the percentage contribution to this transformational scenario of each of these three factors. And it turns out that 33% of the increase is simply due to an increase in the workforce. Well, we could increase the workforce anywhere else in the country and get the same effect. More workers, there's more, there's more GDP output from the total worker population. 57% of the increase is due to the assumption that worker output increases. Well, again, you'd get that effect all the way across the country, no matter where the workers are, you could make that assumption at least. And only 9.2% can be attributed to the Silicon Valley effect. And only that 9.2% could be claimed, justifiably or not, unique to the Ox come up, the situation of Oxford and Cambridge and the geography in between. Do we really need all this development just for a, a, a dubious 10% increase contribution to increased GVA? So the economic case for the art is actually very suspect when you dig into it. Finally, the environment. What's going to happen to the environment? Of course, if you put a lot of new housing, you're really going to make the environment a much worse situation than it is at the moment. And fairly rapidly, the environmental NGOs, the RSPB and the various wildlife trusts began to jump on board the ARC proposals and said, look, let's improve nature as all this development happens. Nature's ARC be a part of it. This is an RSPB document. These are from the wildlife trusts. There was a campaign just over a year ago, 100 miles wilder. 100 miles, of course, refers to the distance between Oxford and Cambridge. They wanted to make it wilder. Now, at about that time, natural Cambridgeshire, looking just at Cambridgeshire's wildlife, came up with the phrase of doubling nature. He said, within Cambridge, let's double nature. Now, in fact, there are some parts of nature in Cambridgeshire which is remarkably easy to double. For example, Cambridgeshire has the lowest level the lowest amount of uh, natural woodland of any county in England, it's a few percent. It's very easy to double a small percentage figure. But the idea of doubling nature was then adopted across the ARC by the environmental working group of the ARC universities group. And they produced this document here with Bridget Smith, who's the ARC czarina on matters environmental, saying that sustainable economic growth and the enhancement of the environment are compatible and achievable. In other words, she was saying, we can have this growth and we can make the environment better in the process. I'm sorry, but we can't. And I'd like to explain why we can't. One problem is that none of the environmental NGOs, uh, the Wildlife Trust, the RSPB, the Woodland Trust, and even CPRE, Friends of the Earth and so on, none of them have been designated as local partners and the local partners turn out to be the group which at the moment is deciding all future ARC plans. And we'll see what the local partners group is in a later slide. So the question is, well, we're worried about environmental protection and there is going through Parliament at the moment an environmental bill, in fact, just come back from the House of Lords. The environment NGOs are trying to get various amendments to this bill to make it better. All of those amendments have been rejected by the government. But the environmental bill does include one important clause that people are getting very excited by. And it says that all new development should be accompanied by a 10% net environmental gain. Obviously development destroys some of the natural environment. The environmental bill says all new development must be associated with 
10% net gain. And of course, on paper, that looks quite promising. This is from a DEFRA document that explains how net gain might work in practice. It gives us three scenarios. Let's look at each of them in turn. Scenario A is very easy. We have a field that is being developed. So here's the field before development. We have one tree on there. The developer comes along and within that site, he builds several houses and actually manages to create or rather grow more trees. So in this case, we've got on-site offsetting of development. And what I should have explained right at the start here is that offsetting is the fourth step of four steps that the developers are supposed to look at before they build their houses. The first step is actually to avoid harm in the first place, try not to do any damage. The second place is to reduce the damage that's been due on site. The third is to enhance on site biodiversity. And the fourth step is off site offsetting that we'll see in a minute. But in scenario A, the developer does everything on site and leaves the biodiversity in a better state than when he started. So this is on site offsetting of development. That one imagines might be quite scarce. In scenario B, we've got the field that's developed. And at the end of development, we've got four houses, but we've got fewer trees than before. So in this case, the developer is obliged to do off-site offsetting, pays some money to an environmental NGO or to a company that creates a habitat off-site with a biodiversity value that makes up for the biodiversity that, that is lost from the development site. This is called off-site offsetting. And the third scenario is in a situation where there isn't land available locally for off-site offsetting, the developer will pay a tariff. So this is exactly like scenario B up to this stage, but the developer needs to do some offsetting. There is no land locally available. So he or she pays a tariff into a national conservation fund and the offsetting occurs elsewhere. And this might be very far away from the development site. Now the problem with scenario C of course is that all the local people they experience all the pain of development all those houses are built on their doorsteps and they experience none of the gain of offsetting which may be tens or even hundreds of miles away. So those are the various scenarios for offsetting but the message from all three of them is that if there is no development there will be no funds for nature. This is a quid pro quo they're not prepared to give funds to save nature for its own sake. They will only provide funds if in return for those funds, they are allowed to build houses on part of nature. Now, biodiversity offsetting has been likened to many things. It's been likened, for example, to blowing up the National Gallery and offering to build an art school in its place. The other uh, idea I like is it's like taking Westminster Abbey, a wonderful, beautiful building. These are like our ecosystems, beautiful functioning ecosystems, reducing Westminster Abbey to a pile of rubble. This becomes the building site, moving that pile of rubble elsewhere to the offset site and saying it's the same. Of course, it's not the same. It's not the same now and it never will be the same because all the species that lived in Westminster Abbey or, or ecosystems before it was destroyed, where will they live during the time that it takes for our pile of rubble to grow again into Westminster Abbey? It's completely ridiculous to imagine that this is going to work. And yet HS2 is doing precisely this along the route. They're plowing up ancient woodland, woodland that takes hundreds of years to grow to maturity. And they're taking saplings from that woodland and planting them in their offsetting off sites and saying we are moving ancient woodland. Of course they're not moving ancient woodland. That's an insult for the intelligence of a 10 year old to pretend that they are moving ancient woodland. But the other real problem with the net gain idea, you see net gain sounds like you're sort of gaining something, is when you look under the hood it's an actual loss of habitat because as I'll explain in just a minute, net gain is all about the yields and the actual loss is all about the stock. And what do we mean by yields and stocks? Well, it's actually quite useful to think of the, exam the example of fisheries. Um, we have a, a stock of fish in the sea. 
and that stock is replenished each year by reproduction and there are losses from the stock by death. Now we come along with our trawlers and each year we take a yield and it is a yield per annum that we're taking from the stock and the stock replenishes itself despite the fact we're taking yield. But you'll appreciate if we take more yield than the stock can replenish, the stock itself begins to diminish. And you can see the stock in the ocean here is disappearing. So you can work a stock so hard that the yield itself eventually collapses. Now let's apply the same idea now to development sites. I want you to imagine two fields, one on the left and one on the right. At the moment, neither is developed. The land is the stock. Now the yield on each stock are the grasses, the flowers, the herbs, the hedgerows that grow. And we're going to use DEFRA's biodiversity metric and we estimate there are 100 units of biodiversity in each field at the moment. What then happens is one field is up for sale, a developer comes along, says I want to build houses. And the developer basically plows everything up, destroys everything that's there and builds houses. So we've lost 100 units of biodiversity from the site. It's completely covered in houses. So in this case, off-site offsetting is required. The builder employs an environmental NGO or a company to generate extra biodiversity on another site, field two, we'll say. And the obligation is that he should produce a 10% gain on what is lost here. So there were 100 units here. They produce 110 units on the offset site. So at the end of the day, we've got 210 units on the offset site, where previously we had 100 on each. Now, according to the environmental bill, the net gain has been achieved. We achieved net gain. But notice what we're doing. Just as with the fisheries example, we're working a smaller stock much harder to produce all the yield that previously came from two fields rather than one. You actually halve the stock in our example. And this stock here that was field one is lost forever. And this is the whole Achilles heel of all net gain arguments is that it's an argument about yield. It's not an argument about stock. Stock is always lost in net gain activities. Net gain always involves a certain loss of stock. That's the fault of it. Now the problem is, or the question is, does it actually work? Let's just run with it for a moment. Say, well, what examples do we have where net gain has been tried and have they succeeded? England doesn't have much experience to date on offsetting, but other countries do. Europe's been doing it for a long time, Australia and America too. In Austria and Germany, they had 40 years experience and you can see the conclusions. A substantial proportion of offsetting has failed to achieve the objectives. Hmm, doesn't seem to be working. In Australia, on the offset sites, they reckon it would take more than 140 years for the offset site to grow to the biodiversity value of the development site. 140 years. We have some very limited experience in the UK of two-year pilot offset projects. They were retrospective studies. And the conclusion was there was a shortage of expertise or a suitable offset sites or an unwillingness of developers to pay for the full impacts. Now, certainly points two and three are going to be eternal problems in the UK even if our expertise improves. Very recently, the Durham Institute of Conservation Ecology in the University of Kent decided to do a literature survey of all the examples of offsetting globally. It dug out 16,000 articles in the literature, sadly found very, very few studies where there was sufficient data to work out whether loss or gain had been achieved in these studies. And the studies mostly concerned not net gain, but no net loss. In other words, on the offset site, did they simply replace the biodiversity that lot was lost on the development site? Now, the studies they did find covered 300,000 hectares of offsets. That was 2% of the global offset area. So in fact, it's a fantastic representative survey of the offset experience globally to date. And the results are here on this histogram here. The green histogram represents the number of sites where no net loss was achieved. There was success. 
on all the other sites, two thirds of the site, either no net loss was not achieved, it failed, or the outcomes were so uncertain that you couldn't say whether they'd failed or not. In some sites, the uh, successes were very often experienced in wetlands and other sites like forests, there were no successes at all. So in fact, in all the global experience we've got, no net loss was achieved, only one in three cases. And Dieter Helm, the chair of the Natural Capital Committee has said in public, no one has yet achieved net environmental gain at scale. And the five counties, the art counties, are an attempt to achieve net environmental gain at scale. So remember that figure, net gain chances of success is about one in three. Let me ask you a question. Would you let a loved one go in for a major operation in which two out of every three patients die? Because that's exactly the fate of our environments if we proceed along the path of net gain according to the environmental bill. Now, net gain uses the DEFRA, something called the DEFRA's biodiversity metric, which is a number which has no quantity. It's a dimensionless number. An alternative that, in fact, Dieter Helm's group is suggesting is to put a capital value on ecosystem services. Now, you can see why economists like capital numbers, capital values, because they can bring the environment into their economic calculations. They can essentially see, is the environment worth saving economically? And I want to show you what the natural capital approach uh, means and how it works. And we're going to go into Ullswater, into uh, Wordsworth country, and look at the capital value of Wordsworth's floating daffodils. Because let's imagine in Ullswater that EcoBurns, a company with fantastic green credentials, wants to build a waste incinerator in Ullswater. Believe me, worse things actually happen. So let's look at natural capital accounting. The uh, ecologists come along and they look at what Wordsworth was seeing and they attribute a capital value. Now, these are simply specimen numbers I'm going to show you, but this is actually how it works. First of all, vales and hills. Well, we like walking vales and hills. Vales and hills have a leisure value, an amenity value, which economists can put a number on. In fact, it's what we're prepared to pay in order to get to Ullswater to enjoy the scenery there. But also, of course, bales and hills are active in flood prevention. Uh, woodlands at the top of hills act as sponges and they release water slowly into the rivers and streams. So they prevent floods. So we can put a, a capital value on the bales and hills. And then the host of golden daffodils. Well, we can pick the, the daffodils and sell them in, in, in the market. Let's put a capital value of 50 pounds on them. And then there's a lake. Well, water companies are very interested in lakes. They like water from it. And so that has quite a high capital value. Beneath the trees, well, they have a, 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 an amenity value, but they also have a commercial value. You can chop them down and make tables out of them. We put a value of 200. And finally, fluttering and dancing in the breeze. Well, there's a huge public health benefit to breeze. It drives away, blows away pollution. So we can put a capital value of 100. These are all nonsense figures, but let's add them up. And let's say the total natural capital value of Ullswater is 1850 per unit area. And notice that's a, a yield per annum. This is a yield from the stock of Ullswater per annum. And let's say for the sake of argument that the Eco Burns reckons that their waste incinerator benefit is more than the natural capital value of the environment. Now an economist looking at those two numbers would say, well, go ahead and burn, uh, go ahead and build the incinerator because it's going to produce more money per year than what will be lost from Ullswater, uh, according to Wordsworth's uh, look at it. <laughs> you might smile at this example, but this is what's happening across the arc. This very important document that came out in February from HM government, no less, is the arc spatial framework document. It lays out a timetable during which the government will produce a detailed spatial plan for the development of the arc. And you'll read there that they've actually looked at the natural capital value of the environment across the arc. And they're saying that that produces 2.27 billion of environmental services each year, it's on page two. <laughs> now, if the economic development that we saw uh, before goes ahead, 
then they saw the economic output growing by these two figures that we see before, by 163 billion per annum, according to the transformation scenario. An economist would look at these two numbers, that very small number there, that very large number there, and say, well, in economic terms, you could actually concrete over the entire arc. You'd only lose this small amount of ecosystem services. You'd gain this huge amount of economic returns from all that concrete pouring. And that raises the question, well, why do we bother to save nature across the arc? Well, that's a question that will be raised in the minds of economists. Why should we make all this effort to save such a small amount of ecosystem services? Now, of course, we all know what's happening here is that the economists aren't valuing our ecosystem services high enough. If you think the economy is more important than the environment, try holding your breath as you count your money, as, uh, some, as some environmentalists have already said. Now, why should we be worried? Why can't we just criticize the net gain concept of the environmental bill and say, look, this is nonsense. We need to invest in nature to save it for its own sake, not for what it can do for we human beings. We should be worried for this reason. reason. Very recently, the Wildlife Trust have put out an advertisement for a managing director of a future nature wildlife trust consultancy. Now the ENGOs are currently charities. Uh, they receive donations and they do charitable work. When they develop a business arm, they have to set up a company. And this is what's happening here. And it's a company in order to offer services to developers to work in the net gain of the environmental bill. They're saying to developers, look, we will offset the land for you We'll run the offset site for you. We'll make sure you gain the biodiversity on the offset sites. And we can even offer you maybe some of our sites for offsetting land. When we look at the job description of this new post, the person will have to have knowledge of legislation, species and habitats. Well, it's an ecological appointment. They should know something about species and habitats, but also some knowledge of the planning system. And you could go into the application pack, that's made even more clear. You have to have some knowledge of biodiversity net gain here and here, and the biodiversity metric, DEFRA's metric that we looked at before, and knowledge of the planning regime. This is the Wildlife Trust essentially selling their souls to planners. So if you imagine the Wildlife Trust as, I'm afraid, puppets, then those puppets are going to be worked by arms of government that are determined that development should go ahead across the arc. And of course, all those property owners and developers who will benefit from arc developments, including of course, many Oxford and Cambridge colleges who are huge landowners. The question at the bottom here is, can the wildlife trusts really resist all the lobbying that they'll be experiencing from all of these people who want the arc to happen? Finally, democratic deficits. The question is very often, who's in charge? Now, we learned very recently that in fact, Boris is in charge. Boris, this has become one of Boris's pet projects. And if Boris's track record is anything to go by, we should be deeply worried. If you think of Boris's borough, Boris's airport, um, Boris's many other um, false dawns, then um, uh, heaven help us. We have a whole series of ministries that are producing documents about the ARC, but up till the present time, they haven't been very well coordinated together. And most of the running at the moment is being done by a group within the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government, Robert Jenrick's um, ministry. And it's the ARC Leadership Group. And the ARC Leadership Group is the group of local partners I referred to before, which are 31 local authorities all across the ARC, four local enterprise partnerships, purely interested in businesses across the ARC, and then the nine ARC universities. We have had told to us very definitely that this local partner group will not be extended either to the environmental NGOs or to groups like our own, the No Expression Campaign. We weren't surprised they refused to allow us in, but we were stunned that they wouldn't allow uh, the campaign to preserve rural England or FOE or the Wildlife Trust into this leadership group. These are deciding the future shape at the moment of the Oxcomark plans. 
And that group between them have produced the economic prospectus to a great fanfare towards the end of last year. The industrial strategies came from the enterprise partnerships and then the art universities group looking at the environment. And of course, all the high tech industries coming out of the art universities. And the other group doing much of the running at the moment is England's Economic Heartland looking at transport, which is uh, within the, or rather responsible to the Department for Transport. So these are the two key ministries, but clearly these other ministries are also involved in ARC plans. And the document you saw just now, the spatial framework document in February, promises that by the middle of this year, about now, they will have created an ARC growth body, which is a cross ministerial body that will drive this process forward in future. So what is being run effectively from this group at the moment will go to a much higher level in uh, the middle of this year, any time now. To date, there's been absolutely no democratic engagement whatsoever with any of these ministries, with any members of the public or community groups anywhere across the arc. It's almost as if the minister will not see you now. A colleague of mine says nothing moves faster than a bandwagon in a vacuum. Well, this is very different as a bandwagon and it's moving in a democratic vacuum. Chris Krasnowski, who's in charge of the uh, ARC leaders group within the Ministry of Housing, freely admits this is a Whitehall plan with uh, local partners. And we saw the list of local partners before. It doesn't involve the communities at all. So what are the rather sad conclusions about this dreadful project? Well, first of all, there must be a limit to housing numbers in the ops come up. We can't squeeze all that extra growth into such a small fraction of the country. We need frequent, affordable public transport. We don't need more of the same car dependent sprawl, which is what those connectivity studies are threatening. In terms of the economy, only 9% of the proposed benefits of the art can be attributed to a, a Silicon Valley effect. And all the other benefits could be experienced anywhere else in the country if you put that number of workers there and you made the same assumptions about their increased economic output per worker. The biodiversity net grain metrics are deeply suspect and they measure yields, not stock, and they mostly fail in the examples worldwide where they've been trying. And our preliminary experience is very poor and some very recent documents suggest that it's going to be even poorer than we might imagine. No communities have been consulted so far across the ARC. We have been promised this for at least the last two years. We've promised it again when the ARC growth body is launched. We'll wait and see what happens. But at the moment, there is no democratic accountability at all. As George Monbiot said in the Guardian article, the bigger the project, the more secret the government keeps it until the last minute. So in its present form, the Ox come ARC plans really have to be scrapped. We have to stop them it would result in untold devastation of our environments. It wouldn't create the economic benefits that are promised for it. It's simply wrong and it certainly wouldn't achieve leveling up across the country. So here's our past. This is what we started out at. We took our petition to 10 Downing Street uh, in February, 2020 with Greg Smith, uh, new MP for Buckingham and Leila Moran's there as well. And these are the uh, No Expressway Group members who are allowed through the gates of Downing Street. We've now changed our name to the Stop the Art Group, and we'd be very, very happy if you join us because uh, we have in front of us not a sprint, but a marathon, and we need all the help we can get. That was our No Expressway Group. We've now become the Stop the Art Group. These are our contact details. Please do write and join and ask questions and help. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. <clears throat> Uh, it's the second time I've heard you talk, and uh, again, my jaw is just dropping onto the floor. So shocking, so shocking what you what you reveal. Um, it, it's it's really appalling. Um, your slides are so clear. Uh, I don't know how you master all those figures. My my brain reels every time, but somehow you 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 make the point every time. It's it's. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sure everybody else is, is as stunned as I am. Um, people, if you've got questions, um, I'm just looking at the chat box now. Um, 
Richard says the Oxcam arc is concentrating UK economic development in the southeast. I guess that's a, a point you're making, Richard, that, that Boris talks about leveling up and spreading the wealth and the enterprise all over the UK, but clearly he isn't. Do you want to unmute and talk to that? Yeah, I'm sorry, ignore the first bit. I, I hit return before realizing that you mustn't hit return to start a new yes. <laughs> paragraph. <laughs> ah, okay, too, so that one is from you as well, yeah. Yeah, so, so, so really my point was that, you know, that this is to, you know, the, the concentration of economic development in the Southeast. Mm. Um, why aren't the, uh, well, specifically the, the new red wall uh, mm -hmm. uh, conservative MPs up up in arms, but more more nationally, why aren't other areas up in arms about this? Do they know about the Oxcam arc and what it's going to do? And that the Oxcam arc, by the sound of it, is going to be sucking yes. uh, population yes. from and economic development from those areas. Mm -hmm. And uh, clearly, th this is nothing to do with uh, leveling up or spreading. Uh, yeah. Economic de development across the nation, and and, and this is the, the you know the United Kingdom, yes. as you pointed out at the start. You're, you're quite right, Richard, and it's amazing the acrobatics that the enthusiasts of the art go through when they start talking about leveling up. So you and I know what leveling up means. It means basically investing in the north and not so much in the southeast. The people pushing the art say we're going to level up the country by developing the southeast. The Southeast becomes richer, and what we provide to the Treasury can then be used for levelling up across the country. I mean, what nonsense they're talking. The other thing they say, which is almost obscene, is they say, well, of course, there's lots of inequality within the ARC itself. ARC development will level up within the ARC. And you point out, well, yes, but 20% or more of the children in Oxford City and Cambridge City, they are living in poverty at the moment. You don't need an ARC to solve that problem. You need some decent governance and some social housing. You don't need an ARC for this. In terms of uh, groups outside the ARC and Northern MPs, we're trying our best to establish contacts with them. And there are, of course, hopes. There are quite a few studies that show alternative ARCs or investment hubs across the country. I can send you a whole list of them. And you may have come across Jake Berry's proposal called a Northern Big Bang. Jake Berry is a Northern MP, and he's saying, look, let's look at the industrial centres, the old industrial centres of Manchester, Sheffield and so on, and let's set them on the path of developing the green recovery industries of the future. And what Jake Berry is asking for is Northern Big Bang of the government is the government needs to enact some enabling legislation to encourage industries into the north. But he then says he wants the government to stand back so that he can unleash uh, what he calls it, a tsunami of investment into the green industries of the north. Now, the great thing about that, of course, is that the original industrial revolution wasn't government funded. It was funded by independent individual investors in the industries of the north. Jake Berry wants a new version of that in the 21st century. The problem with the Oxcam Arc is that all the people across the Arc are waiting for the government to invest. They say the government's got to put some infrastructure in and then industry will add some extra to it. And there is across the Arc very much a first mover problem because the government admits it doesn't have the funds to kickstart the Arc. And the developers saying, unless you kickstart the Arc, we're not going to invest in the Arc ourselves. So it's like a standoff. Now, the government certainly says we can't afford it as a government. Um, but of course, once it gets going, it will generate a lot of revenue for you business people. So you have to invest. You have to get it going. So you've got two different models of a development in two different parts of the country. OK, so but you wouldn't say that there's any point in, in us, for instance, writing to northern MPs alerting them to the Oxford Cam Arc and saying, why don't you lobby the government? Because this is a plan that's going to be detrimental to the North. They're, they're, they're already aware of it, Carol. I'm sure yeah. they're already aware okay. of it. Okay. Uh, I mean, for example, there was a wonderful, I don't know if you've come across, the UK 2070 Commission. Uh, Bob Kerslake produced it. And it's well worth reading. So the UK 2070 Commission looks at how the UK should develop to 2070. And Kerslake makes the obvious point that if you invest more in the southeast, 
you, it's a lose-lose situation because the southeast actually grinds to a halt. They're already overheated. If you put more people in, there's more congestion. House prices don't come down. The whole thing falls. Of course, the north, getting no investment, continues to decline. Kerslake calls that a lose-lose situation, which certainly it is. He then points out, if we invest in the north, clearly the north wins out with investment in the north. But he says the south also wins out because we've got less congestion. We've got less pressure on our housing. So wages can just about keep up with house prices. And everybody's happy in the south and the economy sort of uh, floats along and it's its own sweet way that it's always done. This is a win-win situation. Both sides win. Yeah. If we go along at present, it's lose-lose. If we follow Kerslake's recommendation, it's win-win. I mean, it, it's almost a no-brainer. Okay. And the reason why the arc is being pushed so much is partly that those people promoting it are ex-students of Oxford and Cambridge universities. They see no other solution but the solution of their, uh, uh, of their university. Okay. And I'm afraid even some of the promoters are saying that. So people from Cambridge University say, look, we talk to industrialists worldwide. They want to invest in the UK. For them, the solution, it's Cambridge or it's nowhere. It's not Cambridge or Wigan. It's not Cambridge or Milton Keynes. It's Cambridge or nowhere. Therefore, we have to have this arc. Completely unacceptable. All right. Completely unacceptable. Thank you, David. Um, Sarah Ball makes the point that there's some, been some very encouraging um, recent election by results. Yes. yes. By election results. Wonderful. Um, yeah. Yeah. We, we, the No Expression Group uh, decided to target during those recent elections those members of the ARC leadership group, that key group in the Ministry of Housing, that were up for re-election. And we, we benefit from a, a social media campaign person who's helping us out. We put lots of tweets and Facebook posts out. And we had uh, over 130 odd thousand views of our Facebook posts. And two of our targets were Ian Hudspeth in Oxfordshire because he sits on the ARC leadership group as chair of the Oxfordshire County Council. And the other one was Mayor James Palmer of Cambridge because he also is a, a, a frequent spokesperson for the ARC. And both those county councils were Tory dominated. They now have a mixture. They have an alliance of non-Tory county councils. They're Lib Dems, Labour and Green or Independent alliances. Mm. And this, I, we think that our campaign actually achieved more success than dear old Keir Starmer's campaign in overturning the Tory administration because uh, the blue wall in the South is beginning to crumble because people in the South are fed up with the level of development that this Tory government is, is throwing at us. Now, what we need to do now is we need to write to these newly elected councillors in Oxfordshire and Cambridgeshire and say, look, you now need to put your policies where your votes were. We voted you in because we didn't like the high growth agenda of Hudspeth and Palmer. Now we expect you to do something for us. And the first thing you can do, and it's cost free, quite frankly, is to withdraw from the art leadership group. There are no funds coming from the government at the moment to those people who sit in the art leadership group. But if they withdrew from that group, it would send quite a strong message to the government that the electorate is rather fed up with art plans and that the individual councils don't want to go along with it. OK, so that's something specific that we can do. Something very specific we can do. Your local councillor, or yeah. quite frankly, whatever political shade, whether they were re-elected or not, you can say, look, the electorate showed very clearly in those elections that they don't want the high growth agenda. In our case of the Oxfordshire growth deal, hmm. for which, of course, Ian Hudspeth was the champion, the architect of the Oxfordshire growth deal, was Ian Hudspeth. We managed to boot him out. Yeah. And he was shocked and stunned by that result. He did not expect to lose. Yeah. All right, I'm going to move on to the next question. Um, Jim Assel, who's a, a planning lawyer, amongst many other things, um, says, how will these proposals be navigated through the planning system? Uh -huh. Their implementation depends on either a complete prior revision of the planning system or a series of calls in of planning applications yeah. under the current system, yeah. or both. This is... a. A, a fantastically interesting question. So Bidwells are property developers. They've got lots of legal experts, of course, advising them on how to develop various regions. And what we're talking about here is a regional development plan. 
what Bidwell's have said in public is there is no legislation for regional development plans. There's no plan, but there are lots of pitfalls. And the pitfalls might be uh, parts of, for example, the NPPF or the new planning white paper. But there isn't any legislation governing how to create and run and construct a regional plan. To some extent, that should work to our advantage. If there aren't any rules, then we can sort of stop them in their tracks. But of course, this government is very good at making the rules up as it goes along, as in the pandemic, for example. And the fear is that we'll do exactly the same with the ARC plan. But it, it's a huge, I mean, the, to, to put a million houses across the ARC, of course, you can't simply expand Stonesfield or expand my village. You've got to talk about major new settlements. And a million houses is equivalent to about 18 new Oxfords across the ARC, about 19 new Cambridges. Imagine creating that number of new cities in the five counties by 2050. So you have to have a sort of Milton Keynes type development project, um, but you can't benefit from all the legislation that was beneficial of Milton Keynes about land value capture, for example. It's no longer quite so readily available. But of course, any new town would not be done under local plans. Your local county council will have no control at all. If the government decides it wants a new town at Calvert, for example, there's nothing that Oxfordshire or Buckinghamshire can do to stop it. It becomes essentially a nationally strategic infrastructure project in NSIP, where local councils, despite what they claim, have no control at all. Of course, many local councils would like a new town in their district. I suspect that Charlotte probably would, because they regard it as increasing the revenue into their coffers. Um, Presumably it's going, to, it's going to require either the, a, a dictatorial um, imposition of the proposals by the government through whatever bits of the existing planning system would allow that. And I can't see what they would be, a proposal of this extent, or a wholesale revision of the existing planning structure, um, which would have to get through Parliament. Well, Jim, in the budget of last year, do you remember the, the Chancellor announced four new towns west of Cambridge? Four new towns. Now, in fact, these are quite small towns. I think about 15,000 houses. But this is, these are brand new settlements. They'll be on greenfield sites or, or near to existing towns. Uh, and they're quite happy to push these. Now, these are small beer compared to, say, a new Milton Keynes. But if they want a new Milton Keynes, there's nothing to stop them. Uh, they may have to go to Parliament to decide on a particular side. I'm not, well, you will know more about that than me, but if they want to build a new Milton Keynes, I can't see anything stopping them, especially with the majority the government's got at the moment. And, and the fact that quite a few local councils want development. Yeah, but um, I, I suspect they would have to go to Parliament and would, I mean, given given the sort of democratic effect you've just been speaking about, Hudspeth and so on, um, there'd be an awful lot of Tory MPs who were looking over their shoulders at the consequence of voting for that kind of proposal, wouldn't they? Well, let, let's hope so. I mean, Mil the Milton Keynes 2050 plan, for example, it involves doubling the size of Milton Keynes by 2050. It's got about 250,000 people at the moment. Uh, some people want to double it to 500,000. That's within a local plan, not a government plan. And uh, that, that is, in fact, turning out to be quite controversial. But uh, the fact that somebody has that aim is itself quite worrying. They imagine that this would be good for Milton Keynes. All right, I'm going to take the next question. Has any financial costings been made for the negative impact such a concentrated population has on school places, transport links, health, crime, social, historical, etc.? Are there any studies looking at how that, um, what that costs? The impacts on, uh, that's a very good question. Um, when people try to look at uh, increasing the number of cars, increasing the number of houses, they look at it as effectively a system of systems. So you've got a car system, you've got a housing system, you've got a road system, you've got 
For example, an infrastructure system delivering electricity into this region, delivering fresh water. Cambridgeshire is short of water at the moment. And there has been a lot of system of system modeling by Jim Hall's group in the um, Environmental Change Institute in the, in the geography department in the university. In terms of the economics of it all, I suspect the answer is no, Caroline, because it's almost impossible to do. Um, I, I'm not sure where you would start. I mean, you could say, well, um, you could say, well, if we build all these houses, um, you've got so many funds from the S106 contributions or the SIL contributions, you could build so much infrastructure with that. But that's a sort of that's a tinkering with some yeah. of the details. Yeah, I yeah. don't think it has been done, and I'm not sure it, it could be done. No, I, but it, I is, agree. it should be done. It's not always, always I, I was just thinking, sorry to interrupt, but I was, I was just thinking that um, because it seems like a, a lot of the argument what David was talking about was, was the financial benefit, supposedly, of the arc of 160 odd billion. Um, and I think money talks, obviously. So, you know, we need to look at also building up a picture of all the negatives as a result. And, and just to give an example of where I used to live in Vista, um, on the Kingsmere estate, they they bit, they purposely built a school, and within a couple of years, it was the primary school was full to capacity. They no ha longer have spaces already because, um, and so they're having to look elsewhere at a new school building. So, I just think the knock-on effect, both socially and financially, yes. of that sort of thing happening of a concentrated population, must be vast. Um, and I think it would be a really good argument against this. Yeah, yeah. Yes, it would. It would. I mean, you're aware that, for example, the, the infra there's an infrastructure deficit in our county, Oxfordshire. So before we do any more development, we have a deficit of about £7 billion. This is just to keep our present infrastructure going. And nobody has any idea where that money is coming from. And yet the county has committed itself to a dreadful growth deal. The growth deal is for £215 million, we will deliver 100,000 houses by 2031. Uh, 215 million amongst 100,000 houses, about 2,000 pounds per house that so it'll buy you a curbstone or two. It won't provide any of the infrastructure schools that Dave was talking about, the clinics, the hospitals, the teachers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, in, in my department in university in the late 90s, we suddenly realized that the more research grants we got, the poorer we became because each research grant came with insufficient money to pay for the basics, the infrastructure, the computing systems and everything else that kept the, the university functioning. So it got so bad in some departments across the university, the academics were told don't apply for research grants because they don't pay for themselves. Uh, and then the university tightened it up and said, well, if you get a new research grant, there must be full economic costing uh, from, there must be full economic payment from the research funders. Uh, and mostly that didn't happen either. But I think the county's got itself into the same situation. It's like ex every extra grant it gets doesn't actually cover the full realistic costs of what it's committed to do. And certainly that growth deal is a dreadful growth deal. It, it provided such, so few resources to the county to produce 100,000 houses. And when you do the calculations, up to 2050, if we grow at the Office of National Statistics predicted growth rate of 16%, up to 2050, we will only need 50,000 new houses across the county. The growth is for 100,000 houses by 2031. Mm. And what happens after 2031, you're all aware, is the Oxon 2050 spatial plan, which is the foreign local plan. In that 2050 spatial plan, we're supposed to build houses at twice the rate we're building at the moment, twice the rate for the next 15 years in order to deliver the 200,000 extra houses to make up the 300,000 total that these art plans imagine. I mean, yeah, it's crazy. It's and you have people like Barry Wood, Shoreham District Council Chair saying, well, 300,000 houses in 30 years, that's not much. It's 10,000 houses every 10 years, you know, do that for another 10 years, that, that's 300,000 out, that's easy, you know. I mean, when you have people like that, with a mindset like that in charge, you actually despair. But um, the and slight, the slight uh, uh, shine on the horizon, that Barry Wood is up for re-election next year, and we will be targeting him, I'm afraid, like we targeted Ian Hudspeth, he should be replaced. 
Um, really, the last question on here is whether you know anything about the proportion of planned housing to be given to social or affordable. Would that be just subject to the usual planning rules? Yeah. No, that's a, that's a fantastic question. It's something we've identified that if you can read thousands and thousands of pages of art plan documents, virtually not a word about social housing. And you, uh, I mean, don't talk about affordable housing. They will always talk about affordable housing. That's never affordable in the Oxfordshire context. Uh, affordable housing is an insult to the intelligence, but it's social housing. And there's almost not a squeak about social housing at all. Really? Because of course this is a this is a something that's offered to um, landowners and private developers, and they won't build social houses. Yeah, they want to build executive houses. Yeah, because there's more money in them. Much more. Um, David, we've we've trespassed on your time, um, but I'm just going to ask you the last question, which is, mm. what can we do? You've already indicated that perhaps we could write to our newly elected Lib Dem. Councillor and ask yes. him to step yes. away from the ARC leadership group. Is there yes. anything else we can do? We're not XR, so we don't represent members of Extinction Rebellion, so we're not talking about civil disobedience here. We're, yes. we're just wondering what, what our two groups can go away and, and perhaps think about doing. Caroline, what we'd like you to do is to, is to join us, to sign up to our, our list. Uh, we, we produce periodic um, uh, newsletters, not as frequently as we should, but um, like you, we are suspicious of XR. Um, we are talking with XR, but we say to XR, look, we really don't want to be associated with gluing ourselves to police when all, all climbing trees. Um, we are firmly apolitical. We don't align with any political party. We are simply against the art plans. Whatever flavor suggests art plans, we're against it. Uh, we're certainly non-violent. We believe in spreading information about the arc and importantly, we've been advised very recently by so many different people, um, uh, uh, including Charles Secret, who used to run FOE, said that the, the best weapon against these plans is to get many, many members of the public all talking about them, all writing to the MPs. It's the public opinion that will sway the political decisions. Okay. The more people we can get talking about this, objecting to this, the more likely we are to succeed. Okay. And um, so we're, we're in contact with, with Rosie Pearson. Now, Rosie Pearson ran the campaign against the urban sprawl in Essex. <coughs> there are three towns were suggested for Essex, and she ran a campaign which succeeded in stopping those three towns. And Rosie also said, look, you've got to do it through the grassroots. Obviously, you talk to politicians, obviously, you talk to your leaders. But what politicians fear the most is public opposition. That's what we've got to work on. For our uh, No Expression campaign, we wrote to more than 500 parish councils all the way across Corridor B saying, please join us, please help us. Mm. Of course, the response you get is a very small percentage, but that small percentage allowed us to bring the successful campaign we did. We're now planning to write to every single parish council across the five counties, which is going to be many thousands of them, saying, please join us, please pay attention to what's going to happen to you, mm -hmm. uh, and please send us information. Local information is very useful as well, and we'll put it on our website and share it with everybody. Mm. It's, it's raising awareness, getting people to, and also, if you're expert in social media, uh, we are very, very weak in social media, Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram, and clearly social media campaigns have been very useful. Sadly, the young lass was helping us with our local election campaign, Hattie. Uh, she said, look, I, I'm really enjoying what I'm doing for you, but I need to get on with my life. She's an artist and a musician. So she has stepped away. So currently we are without social media expertise. But oh. those local elections really reveal to us the power of Mm. social media mm. we produced about 30 or 40 facebook postings and as i said they were viewed by over 130,000 people an okay. extraordinary number amazing yeah david i think we're going to to draw the meeting to a close now on that hopeful note um because i think that is something we can all do and we can encourage our groups to do this to join you to sign up to your website to your newsletter 
and to keep to keep very much ourselves informed <clears throat> of what you're doing so that we can spread the word and help in any way we can. Please. When, when you when you go to our website, we still got the No Expressway logo on the website, but as long as you sign up there, we want to roll over the membership into the Stop the Art group. We, we will ask your permission, but uh, it's one uh, mailing list at the moment. We want to keep it that way. When do you think this talk will be on your website? Um, it, uh, within the next day or so. Great. All right. Well, I'll drop a line to everybody telling them that and uh, asking them if they weren't here tonight to have a look at it. Um, I'll, I'll send you a note, Caroline, when it's yeah, up. Lovely. Thank you very much. And on behalf of everybody, um, I'd like to thank you again for giving up your time so generously and for giving us such an amazingly informative talk. Thank, thank you very much, thank David. Thank you very much for coming, all of you, really, thank you. Here, here. Thank you very much, David. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, yeah. There are lots of people you can't actually see whose cameras are turned off, but um, yeah. Oh, big thank you from Mike and Ray. Big thank you to, yeah. to David for... Thank you all of you for sitting through it. There's a, there's a lot of information, I know. but Sobering it's, uh, and devastating. It's yeah. a vast project. Thank it you. Is, it's, it's huge, but thank you. Okay. Bye. 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 Bye.